Hey guys, welcome back for another episode. I am sorry that I've been like missing an action for a couple of weeks. It's because I've been in the process of getting out to New Zealand and like settling in. Why am I in New Zealand is the question that I keep getting asked. Like literally anytime I meet anybody, they're like, why are you here? What on earth is here for you? G- good question, nothing. So three years ago, I <laughs> got my heart broken in a queer relationship, which is the worst. Like women are deranged and evil. And we broke up and my heart was quite literally smashed into smithereens. And I was like, you know what? The only logical reaction to this feeling is for me to flee the country. So I decided I was going to move to New Zealand and like start a new life. Like I had plans to change my name and like I was going to wipe my phone of all my contacts, like start a new life. Like I literally didn't even ever want to hear my name again. And I'm really, really grateful that now like I love my name I would you couldn't pay me to change it and I love my life and I love everybody in it and it's just so it so it's had me thinking like wow I was in such a bad place and now I'm in an amazing place and my life is I feel like this is a religious word but it's like fruitful (laughs) but I just love everything about where I am and what I'm doing and it's crazy because I thought I would be in this city like a couple years ago I thought when I got to this city that it was gonna be like a fresh start and I would still be so like traumatized and heartbroken, but I was gonna get over it because I was here and I was away, you know, like they couldn't hurt me anymore. And like now I'm here, obviously a little bit later than I planned to be because it kept getting postponed because like there was just a bunch of things that happened in my life that meant I couldn't come here yet. And now I'm finally here and I'm like, if that girl, if me three years ago could have known how my situation would have actually looked when I got here, like I don't even know what she would have done. She would have probably literally shit her pants like on the spot. Like, the fact that I never wanted to hear my own name again makes me so sad. Like, my ex actually did a number on me. But you know what? Forgiveness is key. I'm really ho- harvest no anger. I'm, I, you know what? No, there's a little bit of anger. Not anger, but like distaste, I would say. Like, she's not very classy. Hmm. But it's not the point. And it's not important. My point is, is I have been thinking a lot about breakups whilst I've been here because I know it's just on my mind. So I was thinking what got me through this breakup? And I was literally walking back from coffee. Oh, so I'm here with my friend. I'm here with my friend. And um, we're walking back from coffee this morning and we were saying like, it's a shame that we are our best selves when we're traumatized. And I was like, that is so true. And it's so disappointing. When I got broken up with, um, I went back to university and I lived kind of in the middle of nowhere when I went to uni. And I would go on these hot girl walks every day. And I would put my, my earphones in. And I would go on these walks and I would repeat things to myself like out loud because I live in the middle of nowhere. And they were like affirmations and like goals and intentions and stuff. And I've never shared this. I've never even shared this with a therapist before, but this is what I used to do. I used to walk on these hot girl walks and I used to say out loud to myself. I'm actually like shy to say this way. I used to walk on these hot girl walks. And I used to say out loud, right. I cut my energy ties from me, my name, and then this other person's name. And I cut their energy ties, their name to my name right? Because I think that's just as important. And then I would finish it with, there is no longer any emotional ties between me and this person, right? And I would say that over and over and over again on this walk, like a two hour walk. And I would say it before I went to bed at night. And I would say it when I woke up in the morning. And I said, there were so many things I used to say, it wasn't just that. But I think that was really what got me over this person. Because for me, it wasn't just like a breakup. It was like traumatizing. It was like, there was so many other things that happened and like so many, there's just like abusive things that, that went down at the end of that relationship that just put me into shock. I think I was honestly in, in shock for like a year to the point where I could not see, I felt like I couldn't see things that were close up. Like it was like my vision wasn't even there for like a whole year. I don't know, I don't know how else to describe it. Like I remember one night, oh my God, this is so deep and personal. <laughs> oh well, um, one night I sat in my room by myself And I literally have videos on this of my Snapchat because I was like sobbing, crying. And I remember trying to explain to my friend, I was like, I feel like something happened. And I feel like there was a glitch in the matrix and I have been put in the wrong timeline because I was like, there is no way that these people have done this to me. I was like, I thought I knew these people. I thought they were my friends. I thought this girl loved me. Like, but it wasn't really, it was more just like, 
none of their actions were things that I knew people were capable of doing. Like I was I was quite innocent and naive, I suppose, but I was like, I didn't know people could be so cruel. And I didn't know things like that happened in real life. And I remember sitting there and thinking, these were people that I thought I felt so like secure around and they have done things that I just did not think that they would be capable of. And I feel like I am in the wrong world. And I was like, I feel like there's another universe out there where my friends still exist and these people are still who I thought that they were. And I feel like, I was like, they might miss me. Like, that's so sad, but I was like, I think they miss me. Like, I feel like my body has disappeared from that realm. I was like, I literally feel lost. I feel like I am not in the same universe because the rules do not apply. This is not the world that I understood that I lived in. No one is behaving the way that I thought they would behave. I was like, nothing. Thing makes sense these people have so deeply violated my trust and my understanding of the way that humans even behave I can't understand what's happening in my life and I I cannot come to terms with it that's the kind of trauma that's the kind of position I was in right at the time so that's why I was like I, I can never be around I was just like I can't be in this area anymore I can't be in this like I was in my hometown I was like I need to fucking leave this is fucking terrible and there was just so much shit and I was like I it was the the worst time of my life. It was a very difficult season. And then I entered after, after the shock kind of subsided, I went into like the most intense healing phase of my literal fucking life. Oh my God, I literally, I was definitely difficult to deal with at this time. But you know what's interesting? Is people, first of all, people don't like to see you heal. That's one thing that I learned during this time. I think it's because it, when you're healing yourself, I think you kind of become a mirror for like a lot of people and most people do not want to look in a mirror. I even f I even know it now because I'm like when I leave phases of healing, I when I see someone who's in that deep phase of healing, mostly because it it reflects something that was not a fun time for me, but I often feel a level of resentment towards people and I'm self aware enough to know what that is, but like I often am like nervous to be around those people because it might dig up some unpleasant feelings and then I'm also like, "Oh, you're also pointing out to me that I'm not doing the work myself." But like I said in another podcast, I think sometimes it's good to not be doing the work. I mean, don't let it go on for too long. But like what I do, and I've noticed this recently, is there's like cycles, right? I'll be gravitated towards an unhealthy thing, whether it's a relationship, a person, or just anything in my life, procrastination or like making bad career moves, like anything, whatever. Say I'm doing something that's not good for me or it's unhealthy, whatever. Then I enter like a healing phase. I'm like, right, I'm done with this bad thing now, but like, <laughs> it didn't do me well, so now I need to heal from it. Also, I just spat. I was like, right, well now I need to heal from the way that I've just like done myself dirty for however long. And then I go into this healing phase and then I just do that for a while. And then I burn out emotionally and then I stop healing altogether because I'm like, I'm emotionally burnt out. And the only way to get out of that burnout is to indulge in an unhealthy thing again. And then I'll indulge in an unhealthy thing again. And then I have to heal from that unhealthy thing again. And then I heal and then I burn out from healing and then I indulge again. And it is a cycle that I shit you not, I'm like trapped in. And I noticed it happening because I was not in a healing phase of my life. Like recently I was just like, I was free balling to be completely honest with you. And I was doing a lot of things that were unhealthy, like not even directly unhealthy. It was just like, I was very aware that I was doing things that like were not, in the spirit of growth, shall we say, or we're in the spirit of growth, but like, we're very much like, the, the purpose that they served was like relaxing because I'd burnt out. And that was growth in itself. Because I remember one time I was listening to Emma Chamberlain's podcast, or no, I think it was a, a YouTube video or something. And she was like, oh, I've emotionally burnt out. And I was talking to my dad about it. And then she was saying um, that he had said to her, you burn out because you don't let yourself rest, but you're always in bed. He was like, you're always not doing anything because you're so tired, but you're not le actually letting yourself enjoy doing nothing because you're so stressed about the fact that you're behind and you're not doing anything. That all that time that you take in bed relaxing stops being relaxing and actually the more of that kind of time you take, the more stressed you become. So actually what you'd find more relaxing is doing your fucking work, but you can't because you're burning yourself out. And all this like time off is no longer time off because you're so stressed about the time that you're taking off. So that's kind of how it is for me emotionally as well, as well as a physical workload. 
because I burn out all the fucking time with that stuff. Like I think I st- I'm yet to recover from university in terms of like workload burnout. But I burn out emotionally all the time. And then what I do is I like free ball and I'm like, fuck it. Let me just be an atrocious person. Not to anyone else, like just to myself. I'm like, hey, let me indulge in these unhealthy people and these unhealthy things um, so that I get a bit of my mojo back. And like I'm interested in growing again. And it's just like not, I don't want to be in that cycle forever. I want consistency. I crave a more consistent relationship with myself rather than diving headfirst into these deep periods of healing and then these deep self-destructive periods I intend to build a relationship with myself that is so much much more substantial for the long run and I can carry it through my life with me on my back on my shoulders rather than having it be like the only thing that is in my life at one time like I don't think my relationship with me, with myself should ever be so all-consuming that I can only focus on that because that is not sustainable I really want to have a good steady relationship with myself that like always encompasses growth but never to the point where I'm exhausted with it and that a lot of making that possible means I have to start like forgiving myself for not being perfect and allowing myself to indulge in unhealthy things and then grow from them gently because like I tend to indulge in the worst thing ever and then grow from it astronomically deeply like I will sit in the bad feeling that the bad thing gave me for so long until I am so sure that I've learned every possible lesson from it like my last relationship was so fucking bad and I sat in the misery from it for so long um, because I was so terrified that if I didn't learn every possible lesson that there was from it, that not only was I a bad person, that it was going to happen again. And then moving on from it, I had to just like develop a trust in myself that like, you made that mistake, you made the mistake to trust someone who wasn't worth trusting. You're not going to make that same level of mistake again. And like, also, you're not a bad person if you make a mistake and you don't learn from it the first time. You are literally just a person. And like my mistakes frequently hurt no one but myself anyway. But I feel like I actually had a genuine belief that I didn't deserve to take up space in the world unless I was earning that space by bettering myself, which is bollocks. Like it's actually bollocks. And I've just been reflecting on like the ways that I used to be ever since I've been here because so much has changed. And it's so interesting, like... I don't know it's just like it's a clear point of comparison for me of where I was then and where I am now just because this is a trip that like that version of myself planned for me do you know what I mean I don't think this podcast has so far made a single bit of fucking sense I am literally just trauma dumping but you know what I kind of like it also I've dropped my ring on the floor one second I hate not wearing my rings or also can you hear my lisp because I got a permanent retainer on the top of my teeth and I'm not loving it it makes my like there's so much air like what the fuck I think I'm gonna get it taken off I think I'm gonna have it in for like six months or a year or something and then get it taken off like once my teeth are like cozy in their new positions and promise not to shift so quickly I think I'll get the permanent one taken out and just sleep in the retainer, which I'm actually supposed to sleep in my nighttime retainer anyway, but I've not been, I've not done it once. I've literally not, not put that retainer in my mouth once since I got my wire put in. Because why would I? Like, it, I've got the wire in, isn't that the whole fucking point? This cost me like 150 pounds for a small piece of wire. <laughs> I literally wanted to bite her hand off when she told me that. Um, I got composite bonding. I don't know if you can tell. Um, and I still haven't whitened the bottom teeth in my mouth so I don't want to fucking hear it if you can see it clearly in this video because like when I post on TikTok you use a little like teeth whitening thing and it kind of like evens my teeth out but then filming with this camera like there's no option for that so I just look fucking crazy I don't mind it but sometimes I've gone like can people see it when I talk to them in real life like I don't think they can but I am enjoying New Zealand like New Zealand um we went out for the first time. I went with Daniel Rhodes, who is on TikTok. And I'd seen him like pop up a few times. And then people kept tagging me in his things. And they were like, he's in Auckland. And I was like, ooh, friend. So then I DM'd him and I was like, can we go out somewhere? And um, he took me out with his friends. And I literally, okay, I don't know. P- okay, I did notice this when I got here that New Zealand people are like nicer than English people. It's kind of like the North of England on crack, which as someone who is from like the South, I'm just not used to it but um 
uh, I wonder how long it was focused on my microphone for. That's really fun, isn't it? I love that. Anyways, um, as someone who's from the South, like it's a bit of a culture shock to have like walk into a shop and have someone be like, hey, how are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm fine. What's wrong? Um, but we went out with his friends and they were literally some of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. Like, it's crazy. Like, I often don't like nice people because I'm like, what is wrong with you? Like, sometimes people are just so overly nice that I'm like annoyed because I'm like, this can't be real. Like, why, what are you doing? Like, I know you like, I know you're even exhausted talking like this right now. Like, why are you being so nice to me? And then there's people that aren't very nice and I dislike them equally because I'm like, well, you're not very nice, are you? No. And then there's genuine people, which I feel like are very incredibly rare and it, it almost non-existent actually, especially in London. But they were just like this genuine group of people. And I've it was like such a breath of fresh air to just be around. I was like, oh my God, your friends are like human beings. That is crazy. I feel like I've not been around a lot of human beings lately. I don't know. I, I love my friends, um, but I rarely see them when I'm in England because we don't live near each other anymore. So what? Basically all my friends live up north because I met all my friends, like all my good friends I met at uni and we've all finished uni now. So they've like fucked off to like, you know, get careers. And like, apparently the north of England is like hot shit. I don't know. I don't know, they're all in like Manchester and Liverpool and stuff, which is fucking disgusting. Cause the train up there is like 80 to 90 pounds. I don't know why they think I'm made of money. Um, but yeah, so I never see my friends anymore. But it was nice to hang out with his here. They're really nice. Don't know what my point was. Um, anyway, yeah. In terms of breakups, I am my best self when I'm a little bit traumatized, but I haven't been traumatized in a long time. And then recently I kind of felt a bit of it come back, just like that same old feeling again. I think just being here and like like thinking more about that version of myself kind of brought back feelings the way that I felt when I was that version of myself and it is violently unpleasant, but it gave me such a good appreciation for myself because I find it very easy. I'm sure people have even seen me do this, like you guys have probably seen me do this. I find it very easy to take the piss out of her. She had no hair. That was when I was bald, was when I was really going through all this. And I did have pretty bad skin as well because the stress broke me out in acne and actually my whole body swelled up at one point, which was really horrible. Like my lips were like three times the size. My eyelids were three times the size. Like my whole face was just round. It was literally just like a stress response. I know the doctors never knew what it was. They were like, are you okay at the moment? And I was like, no. And they were like, okay, it's probably just that then because like nothing's wrong with you. And I was like, sweet, that is so sexy. I've just dropped my ring again. Anyway, like I was bald, I was ac I had acne, my whole body swelled up. And like, I always make fun of that version of me. I'm like, oh my God, yeah, I used to have no hair. Oh my God, I had acne. Oh my God, this, that, and the other. Like, oh, I was like so crazy. I was so hard to deal with, blah, blah, blah. I hate myself for doing that a little bit because I'm like, that version of me, the, the things that she did and what she fought for, like are now the, the things that, I live off fundamentally. I would not exist without that version of myself. And yes, yeah, she went through it. Like, yes, yeah, she was hard to be around. She, in fact, she was nearly intolerable for anyone that wasn't me because she was so scared of everyone. Like I was literally like, I cut you off if you like looked at me wrong because I was so terrified of being done dirty again. And I didn't know. I had no faith in myself to trust a person because I was like, I had put my trust in in some people and they'd hurt me so badly. So I was like, okay, I clearly don't know how to pick them. I can't have friends. And I basically cut off everybody around me because I was like, I don't know if you're trustworthy and I don't believe that I know how to tell. And I'm too scared to have you in my life if you're not trustworthy, so you have to go. And that's basically just the way I acted for like a solid year and a half. And yeah, I was like fucking hard to be around. And yeah, I was bored, but like I got myself through the hardest season of my life a season that I now look back on and think I have no idea how I did that like I forget it's easy to just look back on and discount it and it's very easy to remember that I woke up every day to that reality I woke up every morning for like a solid year and a half to that pain and grew and learned and very much conquered if you don't mind me saying like do you know what I mean? Like it's so easy to make fun of her for being difficult and being too loud and being too bald. But no, actually like I owe her 
everything. Any success I'm seeing now is her. I just have hair now and clear skin. Like she is her, I am me. Like I owe her my literal life and I sit here and make fun of her. Who do I think I am? Like it's not fair and I really need to stop doing it. Especially because I think it's it's bad to make fun of past version of versions of yourself because then you can't sit here and 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 know that future you has got your back because like if I'm laughing at me 2 years ago, what's 2 years from now me doing about me now? Like I'm sure I'll look back and cringe and I I encourage that cuz that means you've, you know, matured, but like I don't want to feel laughed at. You know, because like there's some moments in my life where I'll be crying and I'll be like, or like something bad will happen. And I'll imagine myself getting a hug from my older self that doesn't exist yet. And it comforts me. But I can't do that if I laugh at my younger selves now, because how do I know then that bitch isn't laughing at me? And I need to know that she's not so that I can fucking survive because it's fucking brutal out here. So, you know, but also that's another thing I saw fucking, what's her name? Not Caitlyn Jenner. Who's the pretty one? Brunette. Young. Kirsten. No. Crystal. No. <laughs> Caitlyn. No. Anyway, you guys know who I mean. Young one. And um, she was basically saying that she keeps a picture of her baby self in her wallet to like encourage empathy. And that is so smart. I don't have a picture of my baby self, but I really intend to get one and keep it with me all the time. For some reason, I only have empathy for six year old me and then it just gets really bad after that. And I hate myself, which I'm working on. (laughs) But, and then I have empathy again when I get to about 16 and then it cuts out again till I'd say now, I'd say I hate every version of myself in between, but it's like, I don't know what solicits me hating myself. I think it like, I think it's a lot about how much I perceive myself to have been innocent in that time in my life and how much I see myself have to have been acting off of pure intention. And obviously I was very, very pure intended at six and seven and eight and nine and 10. Like I don't know where, where my, why my empathy drops out of myself. Also, maybe it has some correlation to how physically attractive I was. Okay, not to call myself physically attractive at six, but like I was a cute little six year old. I still had a bit of chub on me. I had a good haircut, like a sweet little face. Then at seven, I just dropped like 20 pounds, which I mean, I probably weighed 30 pounds at seven. So like that was concerning. I stopped eating when I was seven, which maybe I shouldn't say online, but um, my dad left. And then I just uh, went like this and I just would not eat for a long time. Um, I think it was just a stress response. I don't know, but I was very skinny. And then... And that actually, do you know what though? I think my metabolism just changed. I think I just lost some baby child because I never really gained weight again after that. <laughs> like I just remained a very skinny child until then I hit puberty and then obviously I became like an adult weight and I just looked more normal. Um, but I was just like a scrawny little child. Oh my God, also, I was gonna post a TikTok about this and I still might, but I was basically talking about how weird it is to grow up as an ugly kid and then not be perceived as ugly as an adult right? I was thinking about this because there were two things I was thinking about. I was thinking it is like a fundamental fact in my brain that I'm not attractive and it doesn't bug me. I didn't grow up as like being perceived as attractive. I was a funky looking child. I was very, very skinny and I hadn't grown into my eyes or my mouth. Like I was one of those and I just wasn't like attractive I don't know like it doesn't really matter I was seven but like typically like kids at school wouldn't see me and be like oh my god she's pretty do you know what I mean what's funny is I was actually a model from the age of like two I think I started working when I was like two or some shit so technically I was but I did not know that that meant that I was considered to be an attractive child That sounds like such a creepy thing to say, but like, I didn't know that modeling had connotations with that. I just thought, to be honest, I think I thought everybody did it, but like in my brain, I just occasionally got the day off school, which was like a sleigh. And I'd get to go up to London with my mom and go into these like fancy buildings. And I just thought like everyone had jobs (laughs) as a kid. I don't know, really. I never thought, I don't remember ever thinking about the fact that I did that. Um, 
so yeah, again, like I just was like, I was kind of picked on for the way that I looked. Not really though. Like I, I was never really picked on in primary school, but I definitely never had many friends. Like I played alone a lot. Like I would play alone at lunchtime and I would be really embarrassed about the fact that I was playing alone. Um, so I would run around in the playground and what I would do is I would look over my shoulder to like make it look like someone was chasing me so that the, the teachers who were like on playground duty wouldn't worry about me and be like, oh, bless her, she's got no friends. So I'd just run around by myself and then occasionally just like hide out in the toilets. <laughs> uh, I saw this one um, comment on one of my TikToks and it was like, um, oh my God, I bet you were like really popular in primary school. And I was like, babe, no. But like, I was never really, but actually no, I was bullied at one point by this really nasty girl who has like three children now. So like, she actually fuck you, Emma. But like, anyways, she really bullied me. I remember one day she cornered me. So basically what I had said, and this is fucking funny. This is like, if you've seen Big Mouth, this gives like Lola energy. I had said that my dad lived in a manor. A manor, I don't know if Americans use this word. A manor in the UK is like a really big old house. And I was like, yeah, my dad lives in a manor, blah, blah, blah. He'd just moved out. Him and my mom had just broken up. I was like, yeah, he lives in a manor now. He's got a manor. And this girl was like, no, the fuck he doesn't. He's fucking poor. Your dad sucks. And I was like, Ugh, that is not true. She's like, yeah, fucking is. And then she chased me around. Like she was not my friend. Like it, it wasn't even a playful thing. She like chased me around, cornered me with her little posse of fucking girls, cornered me in the playground and was like, your dad doesn't have a manor. Meh, meh, meh. And I was like, yeah, he does. And in all fairness, he did live in a manor. Granted, he lived in the attic of an old man's manor house. He did still live in a manor, do you know what I mean? And I'd go there on the weekends. Did I sleep on the sofa? Yes. Was it a studio attic? Yes. It's not the fucking point though, is it? He did live in a manor, bitch. I am gonna rough your child up, Emma. Honest to God, you shouldn't have like created vulnerable things in this world because I'm still here. And to be honest, I'm not much bigger than them. So it will be a fair fight anyways. So yeah, no, I was bullied at school to, to conclude, but not, not really like I you know how some kids go through school and they are consistently picked on I was not one of those kids this girl just had a personal issue with me I don't know why um oh my god and then this other girl bullied me but you know what this has always fucked me off because she maintains to this day that I bullied her and I god it pisses me off so much so I was a tiny tiny child this was in year three and I had one friend and I barely had one friend because I was so painfully shy I could not speak to anyone and this one friend that I had was my like communicator basically I would like whisper things in her ear and she would communicate with anyone that I wanted to speak to and as we started to get a bit older I think she started to be like okay you're not much fun and she made friends with this other girl who also thought I was a bit weird because I didn't fucking speak which is so ironic now but I never spoke and so they kind of like went off them too and I was already feeling a bit like, oh my God, I'm losing my friends because I can't fucking socialize. And this girl, she starts to pick on me and I remember the first thing she like ever said to me was like, um, your hair is really knotty. And I was like, slag weather. And then um, she like pushed me. We were doing the, um, what's it called? The nativity and we were both angels. We were stood in the back and I was stood next to her and she like, very gently just went like this and then glared at me and I was like that was wildly uncalled for and uh, there must have been a bunch of other stuff that went on because I remember do you remember those those like adverts and those like things that would go on when you were a kid and it was like tell an adult if you're being bullied like you have to tell someone you have to tell your parent you have to tell your teacher I took that very literally so I was like oh my god I'm being bullied and I have to tell an adult so I went home one day and I sat on the kitchen counter with my mum and I was like mum I am being bullied at school and I was crying and she was like by who and then I told her the name and she was like no fucking way so she went into the school and she like complained about it and we had this really shit teacher at the time who did fuck all about it and then I ended up leaving the school for like another reason but this was all in like the same few months I ended up leaving the school and I was like clearing out my drawer and she comes up to me this this kid and she's like it's gonna be way nicer once you're gone and I was like you are kicking someone who is already on the ground. Not nice. I ended up returning to that school and didn't really have any issues with this girl. We went to the same secondary school, never thought anything of her, just ignored her. She's a bit scary, actually. She's, I can very much imagine her murdering me with a smile on her face because it's, it's actually kind of sad. Like, I think something, she's like a robot. It's terrifying. I'm not even going to talk about it because it actually makes me kind of sad for her. 
But we went to, a, I, we were at the same secondary school. We had some mutual friends. And I remember she, one day someone gets back to me and they're like, oh yeah, she says that you bullied her during school. And I was like, she said fucking what? And she apparently genuinely believed that I bullied her. And I think it's one of those things where your parent tells you a different narrative than what actually happened and you make it, you just think that's genuinely what happened in her head. I think that's what happened. But like, it's so weird. Like she actually thinks that I picked on her. Anyway, like that pisses me off. And it's one of those things It's like, I can't even remember year three. So like, you're kind of actually gaslighting me about this. But knowing myself, especially knowing me when I was seven, I was picking on nobody. Granted, I couldn't speak because I was actually a selective mute. So I'm just gonna like take a shot in the dark and say that it may have been the other way around, especially since you were known for being the class bully. But you know, I could be wrong. So I will put my hands up and say, do you know what? I actually have no conscious memory of that year of my life, but yeah, no, I was a mute. So I'll take my chances and say that you in- indeed did bully me, but it's whatever. It's whatever. Anyways, um, but yeah, what the fuck was my point? I was bullied at school. Um, did I even have a point? I don't know. Anyway, I did I end up moving to another school and um, I then did actually pick on a girl. I did actually pick on a girl. That wasn't very nice of me. I picked on a girl. I called her a funny name and um, told her that she was stupid because she didn't know that there were 60 seconds in a minute. I've talked about this before. She didn't know that there were 60 seconds in a minute. She thought there were 100 seconds in a minute. And I absolutely simply had to set her straight. And then her mum was like, you're bullying my daughter. And I was like, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, And then there was something else that happened. I think I... It was... There was 100 seconds in a minute there was something else I think she didn't know her ABCs it was basically so I don't know how to describe this some people are gonna know exactly what I'm talking about Steiner schools Steiner schools Montessori schools and state schools are three very very different things this school was a mix of Steiner and Montessori so we actually built the school from the ground up when I went to this school it's a little primary school and everything in Montessori and Steiner is made from wood fucking everything right and um everything's at a weird angle you don't really have right angles. It's very weird. And the idea behind it is that children learn through play and creativity. And one of the things that hinders creativity is like, for example, learning to read or write or or do maths. And everything is taught through story and through exploration. So a lot of our school was made up of like farm work and like outdoor play and just like creative things. But I had moved there from like a state school so I could read and write and and do all these things. None of the kids could at this school because we were still like seven, which is right about when you start to learn. So they were right at the beginning of like maths and geography and everything like that. They were right at the beginning and I was like three years ahead and I was like, guys, I don't know if you know, but like you're actually really fucking stupid. Like I hate to inform you, but coloring in geography maps, Mm -mm. and so I think I picked on her a bit for that this girl but I it well our class was I think there was six people in my entire class and I think there were 20 people in the entire school and there were like four teachers and we had a farm and we built the school from the ground up um it was very it was a very odd experience I actually got kicked out of that school because I thought everyone was stupid and and in all fairness they were a lot stupider than me because I am somewhat of a genius myself but also like I in year seven sorry no in year three when you're seven years old in England I think you're like doing fractions and stuff and then I went to the school and they were like right so this is how you count from zero to ten like that's because they just don't believe in teaching kids any sooner which honestly I think is great because most of my kids who did that most of my kids what the fuck most of my friends who did that kind of schooling they did it like the whole way through so like they went through sixth form even in that kind of school they came out just as good as anyone else sometimes some of them (laughs) not so much but like some of them came out fine but yeah no I left that and I went back to state education like a fucking quick and I never went back to Steiner or Montessori or did I go back to Steiner no I never went back to Steiner um Steiner school is cool I think it suits certain people and certain people not so much but I remember what shocked me was um I was like 16 and a lot of my friends went to Steiner school and I was just like, oh no, no, I was 18. I think I was dating a girl who'd been in Steiner school or she was in Steiner school or some, some shit like that. My mum went to Steiner school and was 
um, like her whole life and she went to a boarding school, Steiner school. So she raised me in like a bit of a Steinery way. So it was nothing foreign to me. But I went to a state secondary school where the teachers will quite gladly yell at a 13 year old girl at 6.45 in the morning. Do you know what I mean? Um, very different vibes. Anyways, so I was kind of indoctrinated and very used to grown men getting up in my shit and screaming at me and calling me useless. And do you know what? I would give it just as good as I got it. I had no problem. But, and in fact, I would have been bored without that. I was very well suited to the state school lifestyle. It thrilled me. Um, but then I went back to a Steiner school with my ex who was attending it. And I remember walking around and there was a group of boys I think they were nine or 10 years old and they were running around um, and they all have different timed breaks so that they can really experience the playground. And it's not terrifying for the younger kids to suddenly be like engulfed by a thousand bigger kids. Very nice, very considerate. These kids, they're playing outside with their teacher and they're explaining the rules of their imaginary game to her. They're like 10 years old, maybe a bit older, maybe 11. They might have been year sevens. Cause let me tell you, I have had year sevens try and deal drugs to me. And these ones are like, miss, come play our game. You're the fucking, like, it's insane. The trust, the love. And, and then I went back to my, um, my secondary school where there was, I'd gone to pick up my like artwork or something, my portfolio. I don't know why I was there. I'd gone to pick something up. And I walked through one of the small corridors by PE. If you go to that school, right? You know the PE boys locker room. It's like the dingiest hallway ever. And there was a teacher there and he had a year eight or year seven boy pinned against the fucking wall. This child had his head flat on the wall and this grown man was in somebody's son's face at 7.30 in the Lord's good morning, screaming in his face. I don't even know what about. I assume this boy had like spoken over him in class or something. And for the first time it hit me and I was like, this is mental. This is unacceptable behavior. How can you as an adult, right? I thought maybe I'd understand it when I grew up as a kid at the school. I was like, I'll, I'll get it when I grow up. No, no, as an adult, nothing could possess me that would make me scream at another child. Again, I'm not a teacher, so I don't know, but I did work at a summer camp and I took care of 15, 13 year old girls for six consecutive weeks, ate, slept and breathed with these children. And not once did I raise my voice I might have raised my voice a few times actually they could probably call me out on that I did maybe 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 I was a bit of a bitch bitch sometimes but I was more of a bitch in morals rather than getting up in their face and screaming at them and if anyone else had gotten up in their faces and screamed at them I would have not been pleased I don't think I'd have done anything to be honest I probably would have said fair enough but I wouldn't have been pleased and I was just thinking like, God, it's actually insane. No, but on an actual level, it is actually insane. State schools treat children like cattle. It's, whoa, it's disgusting. And that was the first time I noticed it. And I was like, you know what? I probably shouldn't have got myself kicked out of that Montessori school because they were quite nice to me over there. But they were far too nice to me and I just thought they were all pussies. And it pissed me off, so I got myself kicked out. At seven years old. Anyways. I have nothing else to say. I don't think a single thing I've said in this podcast has been cohesive with the point I made before it or after it or made a single semblance of sense. I have just trauma dumped and then talked about school. Okay, that's it from me. I'm gonna go and I love you guys and I'll see you soon. Did I even say that I'm in New Zealand? I'm in New Zealand. I'll be back for Christmas though because I'll be fucked if I miss Winter Wonderland. That shit is my favorite event of the year. I look forward to it all year. And I've already missed Bonfire Night and I'm not pleased. So I'll be back for Winter Wonderland. I love that shit. Like, I don't know what it is, but put me in a balaclava, which I ordered one, especially for the event. A furry green one. Green. A furry green one. Ooh. I ordered a furry green balaclava from weekday. They sent it in pink and I spat with anger, but I have since sent it back with a slightly strongly worded note attached and asked kindly for a green one. <sighs> And I'm gonna get some mittens. I'm gonna find a big fat coat and I'm gonna get drunk and I'm gonna go to Winterland. I'm gonna purchase a churro. The only thing is, who am I gonna go with? That's up in the air. I've never been taken to Winter Wonderland um, by someone that I, that I fancy. 
And it's just another another wasted year, really, isn't it? Anyways, I'm going to go. I love you guys so much. And I will speak to you next week because we're back now. I've got here. I'm here now. And that's all that matters. Did I bring my hard drive? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. I don't think I did. All right. Well, anyways, I love you. I'll speak to you soon. Bye.